This is the Amazing Teacher Podcast with Sam Rangel, episode number nine. Welcome to the Amazing Teacher Podcast, where we sit down with amazing teachers and pick their brains for tips, strategies, and ideas that you can take into your classrooms and be amazing. Now, here's your host, Sam Rangel. Welcome, amazing teachers, to the ninth episode of the Amazing Teacher Podcast. This is Sam from successintheclassroom.com, and I want to thank you for stopping by the podcast. I really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule to hang out with me and these amazing teachers. You know, I have been so inspired by my conversations with all these teachers who have graciously agreed to let me pick their brains. It's just so energizing. And I hope you're feeling the same way. I hope you're getting new ideas and strategies to use in your classroom because that, that's the whole purpose of the podcast. I want to help more teachers just have greater success in the classroom, especially new teachers. I know it's kind of tough those first few years. So listening to these amazing teachers share their tips and strategies, I hope has been uh, helpful to you. Uh, the fact that you're listening to the podcast shows that you are looking to learn more and we're better than from these amazing teachers. Today's episode is another conversation with a truly amazing teacher. Her name is Julia Thompson and she has a site at juliagthompson.com. I found her on Twitter sharing some great advice for new teachers and, and as I did some more research, I found that she actually wrote a book, wrote a book for new teachers called The First Year Teacher's Survival Guide. And I thought she would be the perfect guest for the, for the podcast. I sent her a message on Twitter inviting her to be on the show, and she agreed, and I am so glad she did. I had such a great time picking her brain and just, just talking about school. Uh, she has a wealth of experience, and uh, not only that, she has, when you listen to her, she has a, just a, a great love for what she does and, and the impact she's making on kids. And I know that you are going to be inspired by her because I was. It was, it was great just uh, spending time with Julia, and I know you'll enjoy the interview. Before we get into the interview, I, I want to ask you for a favor. Will you please go to iTunes and leave a rating for the show and maybe a comment? Uh, I know it's going to take a little more time on your part, but it would mean a lot to me. I hope the rating and comment are positive, but I would really like to hear from you. Let me know what you think about the show. If you have any suggestions, you know I would appreciate your feedback, and again, it would mean a lot to me. So thank you in advance for that. All right, so let's get right into the interview with amazing teacher, Julia Thompson. Ready? Here we go. Today, I am so happy to have Julia Thompson from juliagthompson.com on the podcast. Welcome to the show, Julia. Well, thank you, Sam. Glad to be here. Well, again, thank you for taking time out of your day to sit down and uh, let me pick your brain. I'm really looking forward to this interview. Well, I'm looking forward to talking with you. Great, great. I found you on Twitter sharing some great advice to new teachers, and then I learned that that um, you know, the more I looked into your your uh, website and blog, I, I learned that you wrote a book, a book, uh, The First Year Teacher's Survival Guide. So I thought you would be the perfect guest to have on the podcast. Well, well thank you. I've written that one, and I've written a couple others, but that's the one I think I'm uh, best known for. Oh, great, great. I, um well, before we begin, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, your teaching career, how you got into teaching, and maybe um, why you became a teacher, and then perhaps a little background as to why uh, you wrote the book? Well, my, um, I think like lots of teachers, I became a teacher because I love my subject matter. I teach uh, ninth grade English, you know, just one step away from middle school, mm -hmm. and I know you, you used to teach middle school, and I, I became a teacher because I love English, uh, and I love reading and writing, but... I had no idea until I was a student teacher how much I would love students. And I think like lots of veteran teachers, you know, love of subject matter is not going to keep you in the classroom, but definitely um, love of students will. Right. And, you know, I'm intensely curious about my students. I enjoy being around them. I'm, you know, I, I love being in a classroom. Um, I'm just so lucky that I've had a career where I've been able to spend a lot of time in the classroom and I enjoy that. This is year 37 for me. Wow. I know. And wow. I still love being a teacher. I'm so lucky. I just, I can't believe it that I get to do this. Um, I, I still, you know, I don't like getting up and going to school every day. <laughs> I think nobody enjoys the grind. But once I'm there, I'm, I'm good to go. I, you know, I find my students really interesting. And, and, and I always have. Um, about 15 years ago, um, 
I found two things happened at once. And one is that I was teaching in a really tough inner city school. And at that inner city school, my students were behaving. They were doing what I asked them to do. They were succeeding. I didn't have a lot of discipline issues. And at the same time, I was taking a class of recertification. And my professor said to me, the coolest thing that anybody has ever said to me in terms of my teaching. And he said, you know, you write better than any student I've ever had. And with those words, he changed my life. Because when someone you respect as much as I respected this professor praise, praises people, you know, I tell this to teachers all the time, don't ever underestimate the power of praise. Mm -hmm. Because when you can give sincere praise to a student, they take it in and believe it. You really can change things. And because of what my professor said, I thought, well, maybe, maybe I can write a book. And so I went home that night and I outlined the first book I ever wrote, which is on how to make um, high school kids behave. And it worked. And uh, I dedicated that book to him. And then all the other success as a teacher I've had uh, and as a writer I've had come from that one statement. You know, I've been able to, to travel all kinds of neat places. I've been able to visit with teachers in other countries. I have books published in other languages. And it's really cool that I get to connect with teachers around the world because, you know, we all have those same concerns. We all worry about homework and relationships and motivation. Mm -hmm. And I'm just so lucky that I got to have that one professor who said what he said to me was sincere praise and it changed everything. So, you know, I, I always tell teachers, you know, push it, you know, tell kids what you think and it works. Right. That, that, that's awesome. That is so cool. Um, I give him full credit. <laughs> well, that, that that's great to have to have someone in your life that that can um, can take you to that next level. Right. I was I was sitting with this uh, teacher, um, and this teacher told me some really cool stuff about what I was doing uh, in my in my role now as an administrator, because I'm still learning this this part of my career, and she was giving me what I call props. Yeah. Uh, and I took it as, you know, being propped up because at the time I was feeling kind of down because, you know, just things happen. But teachers can, when they give that praise to each other, they prop them up. They help them Absolutely. out. Absolutely. And uh, it's it's so valuable that I have made it a point to do as, as much as I can to prop other people up, uh, especially uh, where I work and the teachers and especially, especially the kids. Well, good for you because, you know, it's the power of the positive that moves people ahead. That's you know, good. negativity can may stop something temporarily, but if you're positive and you can show people their strengths, then you can get somewhere. That is great advice. Great, great advice. Um, I was reading your um, your blog, and I, I found some great ideas that you had posted on there for new teachers and even some not-so-new teachers who are struggling with a difficult situation like a misbehaving student or an overcrowded classroom. And I would encourage listeners, you know, if you're listening to this, take a look at Julia's blog. It's one of those um, blogs where you're going to find just great practical advice and tips that, it's gonna, that are going to help you uh, through those difficult times. One of the posts, in, one post in particular that I, I think a lot of teachers would find helpful was the one you entitled 50 Reasonable Options You Have When Students Misbehave. Uh, this was your most recent post, and I thought it would be a good idea to go over a couple of these options and have you elaborate a little. Would uh, that be okay? Absolutely. And thanks so much for your praise. I appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. Uh, I was looking at the, um, like I said, the 50 options, and I, I, I like a couple in particular if, you, if, uh, if I can ask you about them. Number 11, make students feel worthy of trust. Absolutely. If you think about it, if a st and I've seen this in my own classroom, if a student doesn't think you trust him or her, then that student has no reason to try to win your trust, to respect you. Mm -hmm. So if they've already lost, they're not going to try. So if, this, if, you, if you act like you trust students, don't be naive and silly, but if you act like you trust students, then you are very likely to, to move forward, to get things done. If a student thinks you don't trust them, you don't like them, you don't care about them, then nothing good is going to happen in your classroom. Very true, very true. Um, 
can you give us an example of, of, of um, trusting a student? Uh, if a student says to me, because I teach high school kids, I get lots of emails from students. Mm -hmm. If a student says to me, honestly, I need an extra day to do this assignment, would that be okay? Now, I'm not naive about that. Don't get me wrong. But mm -hmm. lots of times I will say, yes, you have to make that smart decision for yourself because, you know, the, the child is going to turn it in. And the child needs extra time, then I can give extra time. But I, I, I will say, you know, I appreciate you emailing me. I will trust your good judgment on that. Let's go ahead with that then. That's great. That's great. And, and uh, you're probably, probably not going to happen again. No, not, not always. Yeah. It, it just lots of times, you know, I think that students feel that it's their job to test every possible boundary that we set up mm -hmm, for them. Mm -hmm. And so if we, we can give them the opportunity to trust, I mean, to uh, test those boundaries with safety nets, not just a blanket no, but, you know, I, I think you are making a good decision here. Let's make, make that happen. If you can do that, then I think that you will do what you're supposed to do. I think that you can make a positive classroom. That's awesome. Awesome. Uh, another, another one that I, that uh, I saw that I liked a lot and I wanted to uh, get your, your, uh, your feedback on is number 28. It says, be emotionally accessible to your students. Grouchy teachers have more problems than positive ones. <laughs> so that's true. I, you know, I stand at my door uh, every day, and I have enormous classes. I teach uh, 30 plus students in all my mm -hmm. classes, you wow. know. And I think a lot of teachers have overcrowded classes. I know that's one of the most popular posts <laughs> on my blog is how to manage. But I stand at the door, and when students come in, I greet them, but I'm really checking the emotional weather of my room. And so if, you know, I pay attention to who's in a bad mood, who's upset, who, as much as you can tell, just in a crowd control kind of thing, kind of way. But I do think that when students see that you value their emotions, that you do take them seriously, that, that you are available to listen. Now, I don't have the answer to every teenage problem uh, or every student problem, but I, I can listen and I can say, let's go ahead and let me get you some help this way or that way, or, you know, let me send you to a counselor. Mm -hmm. I tr you can't be, like I said, I, I'm not naive and you can't be uh, a pushover, but you do have to make sure that your students know that you care, that you want them to do well, that you have their best interest at heart and that you want them to succeed. And I think when you do that, then, oh my gosh, lots of problems just don't happen in a classroom. All right. That, that is, that is so true. So true. Um, I, you, you said you taught ninth grade? You teach ninth I do. Grade? I teach ninth grade. So that's, that's you know, almost middle school. I mean, and Right. They come to me as yeah. middle schoolers, and they leave as high school sophomores. And it's my job to get them to from point A to point B. Right now, we're making really good progress. It's the middle of the year. Oh, <laughs> yeah. When, like like I told you earlier, I, I taught middle school all my, uh, all, my, all my career. And from one day to the next, they have emotional you know one day they're super happy the next day they're super depressed right. uh they they break up with their best friend one day the next day they're they're back to being friends again so it's all this a this, turbulent this, world right ex exactly so and for you to get them in ninth grade it's almost probably the same thing with uh, it is they're just a just a different building <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah i think you're right I think bigger kids right. around them <laughs> but you you mentioned you mentioned something very important the uh the part about listening, you, mm -hmm. you, like you say, you don't have the answers, but just listening makes such a big deal to these kids. Well, think how worthwhile it makes you feel when you go to, when you go to talk to a teacher and that teacher puts down a pen or pencil and looks you in the face and listens. Right. Even if that teacher says, I'm sorry, that isn't going to work. Um, no, I won't let you do that. At least you gave that person the courtesy of a few minutes of actual listening, mm -hmm. actually taking them seriously. Who doesn't want to be taken seriously? I think the biggest problem comes, one of the big problems that comes in a classroom when teachers ignore students. Mm -hmm. You can't, you know, and so I know that I'm from a large family. If you ignore me, I'm going to do something awful just because, <laughs> you know, I want to have people pay attention to me. You know, that's one of the reasons I write books. So I have a bigger audience. <laughs> <my opinion. laughs> 
And so students are the same way. They want people to listen to them, to hear them. Right, right. That is, that is so true. Uh, and you, you talked about the grouchy teacher. One of the, um, one of the promises that I have on uh, my Amazing Teacher Pledge is uh, I promise to be in a good mood every day. And Absolutely. I know that's probably the toughest promise to keep because things happen. But it's such a valuable, um, you have a, such a valuable effect on the kids if they know that they come to your class, you're not going to be in a bad mood. And, you know, if you think about it, how, what a, a, a terrible abuse of your adult power to be in a bad mood, to be grumpy. That's not your role as a teacher. Your role in a teacher is to uplift, mm. to inspire. And how can you do that if you're grumpy? You know, and I, I have a line that I, I tell the new teachers at my school, you know, you know, avoid those negative people. You know, those negative people just need to go home and put us out of their misery. <laughs> you know? You know, stay away from them. Don't don't deal with them. And, you know, how can you be grumpy in a classroom when you've got kids hopping around wanting to learn something? Yeah, that's awesome. That is that is so true. That is, I've, I've heard of teachers who um, I don't want to be knocking on teachers, but there's some teachers. They have a signal or some kind of sign on their board. Today, I'm in a bad mood. Today, I'm in a good mood. <laughs> how just, silly is that? How, <laughs> just, how pretentious? Yeah, just so kids know, OK, watch out for this. Watch out today. No oh, good grief. Yeah, but That's um, <laughs> I'm in a bad mood just hearing about it. <laughs> I know. Uh, but uh, it's it's a, it's such a great uh, you have such a great so much more power if if uh, your kids in, are enjoying your presence, just being in your class. You right. Can do so much more. Who wants to be around a grump? Right. <laughs> right. Very good. Very good. Well, um, uh, Julia, those um, those fifty. Reasonable options. I think that is such a, some, a great resource for new teachers. Would you allow me to create a, a PDF um, document of that and, and have it available for listeners? Oh my gosh, Sam! I would I would just be honored if you would do that. I would, you know, the more people that can benefit, let's let that happen. I would be very happy if you would do that, and I would appreciate it. Thank you. Oh no, well, thank you. So, uh, listeners, uh, when you hear this, stop on over to uh, theamazingteacher.com or JuliaGThompson.com, and uh, I'm sure we'll we'll have a, a link there. We can download that uh, list of 50 reasonable options you have when students misbehave. It's a great resource, and I know you can uh, you can put it right there by your lesson plan book. Whenever that uh, that student starts acting up, something you can pull <laughs> out. At least and, you know your options. Right, right, and they're great, great options. So thank you for that, Julia. The purpose of the podcast is to sit down with amazing teachers like yourself and pick their brains for tips, strategies, and ideas that new teachers can take into the classroom and be amazing. I know that in your experience, you've run across many amazing teachers. Can you tell us what are some qualities that are common in the amazing teachers that uh, you've run across? Well, I think I sure can. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think one is that uh, good teachers accept their students. And by that, I mean, I know we're in the business of changing lives and, and wanting people to move forward and to change. But I think being accepted by a teacher is a, is a valuable feeling for a child. And so if you accept a student, like you say, OK, well, you can't read that. I accept the fact that you can't read and I will help you. That is so much more productive than saying, oh, you can't read. Uh, who, who was the teacher that had you last year that allowed you to get here? Don't blame. Mm -hmm. Just say, all right, I'll take you from where you are at point B, and I will move you ahead. And that's my job, to accept you, to, to say, okay, you're uh, a teenager or you're a young child. Let me take you from where you are. Let me know about your life and move you to make progress. And I think when people accept students for what they are and, and not expect them to be able to do things they can't do at first, then you can gradually scaffold in the learning, scaffold in the behavior, scaffolding things you want. But I think accepting students, embracing their, them with their flaws and their strengths, I think that makes a huge difference. Awesome. I, think, I think another trait that... Um, you know, you touched on it lightly that that defines an amazingly good teacher is a teacher who is flexible. You know, 
our job is, as teachers, as, as educators, is really hard because it's a very complex undertaking if you think about it. Not only do we have a classroom filled with different kids, but every day they change. You know, right. <laughs> one minute they can be happy, the next minute they're upset. They, they never stay the same. And so the fact that they change so and that our circumstances change so and then, you know, with all the, wow, the recent changes in education, all the expectations on us, you have to be able to go to school and change. You have to be able to say this lesson plan worked last year. It doesn't work this year. Mm -hmm. This child was happy last week. How can I make that happen again this week? Because clearly that child is no longer the child it was he or she was last week. And so I think that good teachers are flexible, you know, not just, not just willing to change a lesson, but the big picture flexible too. What can I do to make a difference? I mean, when I first became a teacher, I had to do my grades by hand because calculators were not right. part of what we did. Right. Um, we didn't photocopy back then, um, you know, back, back in the day. The ditto so, machine? Remember the ditto yeah. machine? Yeah. Oh yeah. And I always had that blue stuff all over me. Yeah. That was yeah. terrible. Chalkboards? Uh, well, I still have a chalkboard in my class. I teach really? in old school. Yeah, no oh, kidding. Wow. One of the few slate boards left. But <laughs> what's really cool is that, you know, you can be flexible. You can change. But you just have to be willing to to jump, mm -hmm. just to bounce is that what I call it. You know, be able to bounce. Say, this worked. Okay, let's figure out how to make it work again. And I think that a final quality that, to me, this is the, the defining thing of a, the defining quality of a good teacher is that teacher doesn't look at kids the same way other teachers do. Definitely, we, uh, teachers don't look at kids the same way other people do. One time I was in a mall with my sister, uh, who is older than I am, and there was a bunch of kids hanging out, just, you know, being rude and dressed funny and, you know, spiked purple hair, piercings, mm -hmm. tattoos, and my sister was just horrified. And I was going like, oh, don't they look like cool kids? I think I can see the future in those kids. I think teachers should be able to look at the future, to look past what's happening right now, to always keep uh, an eye on the goal. You know, in September, we have a goal of what the kid is going to be like at the end of the year. And we always have to keep that goal in mind. And so you have social behaviors, you have beha your behavior in general, and then you have academics and you have skills and knowledge. And so I think that good teachers look past what's going on right now. That doesn't mean they don't deal with it, but they always keep that big picture in mind so that there's, you know, you, you're always looking for a solution. You're always looking for the best way to move from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. And then from the end of the year, we, we always work with the idea that there's a future ahead. And so if you get mired in the present, well, this kid can't read, this kid misbehaves, this kid is defiant, then you never move the kid to where you want him to be. Mm -hmm. But if you say, we are here right now, I want to get you to where you can behave better. I want to, I want you to have a future. I tell my students, don't close any doors to your future. You know, every time you don't do homework assignment, or every time you misbehave, you're slamming a door on your future. And so when you think about the big picture, then the little things that you deal with don't drag you down. They're just steps that you can take to move kids to where you want them to be wow wow that there's so much there uh, julia uh, don't close your doors on your futures on no your future. don't absolutely not awesome. and you know and help kids keep those doors open mm -hmm. and then um something else you mentioned when you see the big picture the little things don't uh, don't matter so much you know you you still have to deal with them like right. if a student is is not doing homework, or if a student is not getting a concept that the student gets and needs to get, you still need to deal with those. But think of those as tiny steps to that bigger future. And then everything, and you know what? It makes you feel worthwhile too. It makes the kids see that they, they have a goal in their lives. I mean, I, it's, I believe that students need a goal. And the, one of the, the research studies that we, you know, the research, research shows us that even students of poverty, everybody, every person has to have a practical purpose for their knowledge and that for their learning. And so you can't just say because I, I think you should do it because I told you to. It has mm -hmm. to be you have a future. Let's get you to that future. And that's my job to help you make your dreams come true. Wow. 
That is that is so good, Julia. So good. That's why I love talking to uh, amazing teachers like yourself. It's just something that uh, keeps me keeps me energized. Uh, a lot a lot yeah. of time a lot of times in in uh, my new position right now, I'm dealing with a lot of the uh, behavior issues uh, that I have, the teachers are having, and it can get tough. It can get it beat you it down. It can wear you down. It can yeah. it can wear you down. But if you think every little thing that you do with, especially you know. I don't teach in an inner city school right now, but I did for years. Mm -hmm. You have to, you have to say there's a purpose for all of this. What is my purpose in making this child do this? And if you think about your purpose, your big purpose is to, to make sure that child has a better life than where he or she is right now. If you think about that, my gosh, what a big calling that we have. Right. 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 That's like I said, so inspiring, so inspiring. So thank you for that. Julia, many new teachers and even some veteran teachers struggle with classroom management. It's something we've been talking about. What would what would be uh, your top three tips, four tips for um, new teachers struggling with that tough class? Well, you know, um, I ha I do have three tips ready to go. Here's right. the first one. The first one is one that seems so common sense, but nobody, when you're a first year teacher, you don't ever think about this, or even a new teacher doesn't think about this. Mm -hmm. And that is, let the lesson do the work of classroom management. Because veteran teachers will tell you that when students are engaged in work that they enjoy, when students are happy, you know, doing something that they find relevant and rigorous and challenging but interesting, they just don't misbehave. Right. They stay on task. They stay, uh, do what they're supposed to do. And that, I think, the biggest thing that, that I would, biggest bit of advice I would give, well, not, not the biggest, but one of the biggest bits of advice I would give any teacher is, you know, design those lessons so that students want to do them. And if students want to do their work, then they're not going to, you know, punch each other and throw stuff right. across the room and sash you because the, a good lesson plan is a great discipline, discipline plan. Very good. Another one I have, uh, is one that, it's just so incredibly important that it's just unbelievable. And that is build relationships, build positive relationships with your students and have your students build relationships with each other. And so I do, I do a lot of stuff in my classroom, you know, to make everybody feel included and to make students know that I, when we've talked about this earlier here, that they, they do feel important. They do feel significant. They do feel that, when they're absent, the class isn't as good as when they're there. Mm -hmm. And so when I put students in groups and I make sure that they really form real relationships with each other, that then they, they tend to bring out the best in each other. And to tell you the truth, that, that when you have a good relationship with a student, then a lot of misbehaviors just don't happen. Now, you, honestly, you're not going to reach every child every day. But, you know, if, if your goal is to build a positive relationship with your students, you've got half the battle beaten right. toward making a classroom full of kids who are engaged in learning and kids who want to do well. That will build trust and respect. And that mutual respect is just key. Mm -hmm. And finally, you know, when I was first a teacher, it was a lonely classroom experience. You know, I, I felt that I was alone in my classroom. And now with all of our great emphasis on not just students engaged in collaborative learning, but we are engaged in collaboration. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is so easy uh, to, to communicate with other teachers uh, online, through Twitter, through blogs. You know, you can form your personal um, PLN. You can do all kinds of neat stuff. You can reach out to people in your building. You can reach out to people on your hallway. You can, you don't have to have just one mentor. You can have a mentor for just about every aspect of your professional life. So I would say, don't hesitate to reach out. Don't hesitate to ask for help. And and if, whether you're a new teacher or any kind of teacher, I mean, I, there's plenty of people at my school, and I'm probably the, old, I'm seriously, I'm probably the oldest person in my building. Um, I still depend on them to give me advice for lots of things. Not just, you know, the things you would expect uh, an older teacher to like technology. I'm pretty good with that. But like, you know, to remember little things and, and we all depend on and I, I depend on other teachers to give me advice about students. You know, everybody 
who teaches a child sees a different aspect of that student. Right. And so when you can collaborate for the good of a student, that's incredibly powerful. So another thing that adds to this too, and you're not alone, students have families. Students have other people that care about them. Involve those people. Be the first to reach out to, to the parents and guardians of students, to the family members of students. You know, include everybody to, in getting the students to where you want them to be, to get everybody involved in a classroom. And so when, when you have engaging lessons, when you have good relationships with students and among your students, and when you get a lot of people helping you work in a classroom, then, you know, that's a tremendous amount of power there of just positive energy being spent in a productive way. All right. Awesome. Great. Great advice. The, uh, you're talking about being alone. When, yeah, when I first started, there was no such thing as Internet or oh, no. Twitter. Uh -uh. Or, so, yeah, you're right. And uh, you just you learn from the people around you, just those those few uh, team teachers that you had. Now you can learn from people around the world. Um, and this, it, this isn't is, it cool how you when you learn stuff from other people, it makes you so appreciative of what you have. Right. And and you, you think, oh, if I can only tweak this or that. And, you know, with the Internet, it is just amazing. One night a couple of years ago, I did a podcast like this, but it was a, a live a webinar kind of thing mm -hmm. with a guy in England and people from all over the world. Crazy time zones going on. were were entering our conversation. It was just so cool to hear people do that. And it, you know, I've been, you know, because of my books, I've had the opportunity to travel a lot to visit with other teachers. And, you know, I specifically one time I went to Singapore to, to work with teachers there. And I tell you, the people in Singapore, the people in my school, the same. <laughs> <You know? Yeah. laughs> we all worry about the same things with kids, but it's so nice to have other people give you advice and get get lots of people involved in a problem. We're so fortunate to have the, the global classrooms that we have today. Right, right. That that that's so so true. So cool. Well, uh, Julia, is there a favorite quote that has inspired you, and maybe we can uh, we can adopt here? Yes, I have. These are ones that I I, I told you I work with new teachers at my school, and mm -hmm. I have three of these. All right. To share. And these are ones that I have. I have a little, um, a little desk calendar and I have these written on my desk calendar. And these have uh, really become uh, interesting in our cohort at my school. The first one I have is to always remember that teaching is a deliberate act, that no one is a natural born teacher. Uh, no one is. That some teachers may make it look easier, but no one finds it easy. Mm -hmm. And that if you take a deliberate approach to everything about your teaching, if you think things through, if you um, prevent, if you anticipate, if a student asks you a question and you say, well, let me get back to you, if you plan thoroughly, if everything you do, you think out in advance and make a deliberate choice, you will do well. You cannot wing it as a teacher. <laughs> oh, yeah, especially, I, I, especially in ninth grade, middle school, <laughs> no way. Well, I don't think anybody can, you know, you, yeah. you just can't because the kids are far more clever than we are. You know, if, as soon as you start winging it, they're all over you. You don't have a chance. Right, right. Um, you have to know what you're doing. And not only that, you cannot, you cannot let them down. And so if you say if you have a lesson planned and if it doesn't work, you have another plan ready to go. You, you just can't do it unless you really make it a deliberate choice. So that's my first one. Teaching is a deliberate act. My second one is probably, this seems obvious, but it's so easy as a busy teacher to get away from this. And that is your students should come first. You know, when I'm at school and I have a stack of papers to grade or I have an email I know I'm supposed to take care of, it's easy for me to put my students to do some sort of independent work, especially as I'm an English teacher. So they could, you know, they could read, mm -hmm. <laughs> they could, they could write while I do something, but that's not okay. The priority has to be students and what students need. If I go to school, like we talked earlier about being grumpy, if I go to school and I'm tired, cause I'm, I'm not going to be grumpy at school. 
But if I, if I go to school and I'm tired, forget it. My students come first. Their needs come first. And so when you look at students coming first and you give them the priority, then your classroom is an enlightened place. It really is. You really reduce a lot of problems. And then my third thing that I tell new teachers, and that is written on my desk, is this. And we just had a huge discussion because about this at school last week. And this is the time of year when it, it gets really hard. Um, here in Virginia, it's dark. It's gloomy. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, the days are dreary. Uh, kids who were kind of okay at the beginning of the year are beginning to lose hope. And, you know, they just can be annoying and obnoxious. And you don't want to allow that to happen. So you have to, to do this. You have to leave your troubles at school. And you have to take your successes home. Because you cannot have a, a, a life where you teach 24 hours a day. You have to have a balance in your life. You have to tell yourself, okay, this is a problem. I'm going to solve this problem. But when I go home, I need to be positive. I need to, to, to leave all the trouble that you have. Because think how much, how easy it is. If you, if you have one negative student all day long, that's what you tend to worry about. But instead of saying, okay, let's put this in perspective. A year from now, this won't have mattered. I had 30 happy students, one not so happy student. Why am I focusing on the negative? Mm -hmm. And so if you can have an emotional balance where you can say school is school, home is home, positive stuff goes home, I'll deal with school problems at school. I mean, nobody escapes grading papers at home. I'm I'm sitting at my desk right now looking at an enormous (laughs) stack of papers that I, I'm divided into little groups that I'm grading every day on my holiday here. Yeah. But, but you know, you can, you have to be cognizant of how damaging it can be to allow stress to overtake your life. You just cannot do that. So you have to say school problems should remain at school. Go home and be positive about it and start over fresh every day. So true. Great, great advice, Julia. Great Great advice. Um, so what what's happening now in your life that you are excited about? Oh, my gosh. School is always exciting. Mm-hmm. But last, uh, this is pretty neat, last July, the third edition of the First Year Teacher Survival Guide came out, and it's doing very well, even though it tends to be a book that people purchase uh, in the spring and the summer. Because, you know, as, as school gears up, mm-hmm. uh, so it's doing well, and I'm excited about that. So I'm doing a lot of promotional stuff for that, and that that's pretty exciting to see. Like, when I get emails from new teachers, I just love it. Any new teachers hearing this, yeah, feel free to email me. Cause I, I, I loved it that one person said this book is like having um, a mentor in a book. You know, so I'm that nice teacher down the hall from you that mm-hmm. will come and help you, except I'm not down the hall from you. I'm just a, a page away. And so that, that's been pretty cool to have the new book come out. You know, to have it to have it be the third edition because the first two were successful. And so I updated it. And, and all the cool new things that have happened in education in the last five years are in it. Like all the, the stuff about collaboration and all the great new technology that you have that we have available to us, that's just been really a positive, wonderful um, thing I was able to put in the book. So that's been pretty cool, I have to say. Well, that, that's, that's awesome. I'm going to make sure that I have a link to that, uh, to that book on the, uh, on the show notes there uh, so that teachers can uh, take a look at it. that. Again. Thank you. I'm happy about that. Yeah, it's uh, it, reading your website and uh, your blog, you have some really great information for for new teachers and even some some not so new teachers that, that you know, I tell I tell new teachers that you know I use my book <laughs> <laughs> it's like a handy resource for me too yeah. because it uh, it tells me uh, what I need to do and also I love learning educational theory mm-hmm. but when I'm in my classroom and somebody has just been defiant I don't need theory. I need to know what to do right then. Right. Something practical. And so practical. Right. So that I've, it's, it's a huge book. It's my, uh, I told my editor, I felt like I was writing the encyclopedia of teaching because it's 560 pages. And then there's another, a DVD that's like another hundred pages. 
But to tell you the truth, no one would, you know, no one's expected to read it from beginning to end unless you had a really cool professor. But um, I use my book. It's, it's filled with anything practical I can think of, you know, obvious, not so obvious, you know, 37 years of teaching right there. Wow. Wow. That's going to be a great, great resource for, hey. for all of us, for all of us. Um, is there anything you'd like to uh, share with the audience before we say goodbye, Julia? Well, just just hang in there. Don't give up on your students. Don't give up on on yourself as a teacher. You know, we we are all works in progress when it comes to teaching. Um, there's lots of resources out there for us. Uh, you know, go on Twitter. Uh, go, you know, look at my book, but look at other books too. Look at all the things that you can do to connect yourself with other teachers and other classrooms, other educators, and you know. We're a work in progress. Our students are works in progress. Mm -hmm. Those kids who are naughty in your classroom right now, in May, they won't be. You know, they, they would have calmed down. They, you know, you, will, you do move, move your class forward, move yourself forward, and that's, that's pretty neat, I have to say. Awesome, awesome. Well, Julia, uh, if people want to say thank you for sharing all your amazing insights, where can they find you? Oh, well, thank you. Uh, I have a, I think the easiest, I'm, I have several websites, uh, several sites online. I think the easiest is the www.juliagthompson.com. Or I am on uh, Twitter at Teacher Advice. And yeah, I have that, a blog, that, but I, I think if you just Google Julia G. Thompson, I pop up. I'll make sure we add those on the show oh, notes as well. Oh, thank you, Sam. Thank you. Because uh, that, that's where I found you. I found you on Twitter and uh, after speaking with you, I'm so glad I did. Thank you. So oh, well, thank you so much. Thank you for your. You know, you uh, offer a wonderful resources. You really do. I was like, oh my gosh, this is great. Oh, thank you. I appreciate thank it. You. Yes. You know, and I, I, this is my way of, of uh, maybe helping the, I guess, the next generation uh, learn from my mistakes that I made. No kidding. That's what I always feel about when I when I look when I was writing my first year, the book, the first year teacher guide. I think. I had to have been the worst first year teacher ever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know any better. I was just terrible. And yeah, so I, I don't want them to make the same mistakes that I made. And, and I've learned that I, I, I received so much more back. Absolutely. From people. I learned so much from my colleagues mm -hmm. that it's just incredible. And, and it's just such a positive, uh, friendly way to do school. You know, you cannot be a little lone wolf in your classroom. And right. be successful. It just doesn't happen. It, you know what? It never did. It's just it's easier now with the technology that we have to connect to each other, and and with the also with the emphasis on collaboration, and sure. how wonderful is that? And and you know, action research. You have a problem at your school. Let's all figure out how to solve it. How mm -hmm. great! A, how great an approach to education is that? Right. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, Julia, it has been a sincere pleasure in getting to meet you. Thank you so much for being on the podcast. With oh, well, thank you so much for having me. It has been fun. And I hope you have good weather the rest of your holiday. <laughs> Great. How's the weather over there? Oh, gloomy and dreadful. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Well, so to the listeners, I know you have received a lot of great information in this episode. Now it's up to you to take it back to your classrooms and implement what you learned today. So until next time, be amazing. The Amazing Teacher Podcast is brought to you by successintheclassroom.com. Learn more about being an amazing teacher by visiting successintheclassroom.com or theamazingteacher.com.